Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. I am so excited for this. Let's get right in to this new review. We are reviewing today a new book by Rachel Aaron, one of my favorite authors. It is the second book in the DFZ Changeling series, which is one of the three series she has in her DFZ world, which is an urban fantasy location that's all about how magic came back and brought back spirits and dragons and stuff. So let's get right into the summary. For those of you who have not read the first book, be warned there are going to be spoilers for the first book. In that book, by a silver thread, we followed Lola. She is a changeling, which means that she is a fairy monster. Fairies are something different from dragons and spirits that are explained in the book. And basically, a young human was stolen from their parents, you know, the basic changeling story, and they left a, essentially a glob of fairy magic called Gossamer behind. She was found by a blood mage who wanted to use her as a weapon. And in the first book, it was revealed that he had been building up the image in the collective human subconscious of a monster called Fenrir, which was unbeatable to any form of magic other than blood magic. Now, I do want to kind of explain this because it's kind of important to the plot a bit. Blood magic is essentially dark magic. It's the evil stuff. We had only heard very scant things about it in previous books. Apparently, it stains you the moment you use it and prevents you from using other magic, whether that's instantly you can't use other magic or it slowly wears away your ability to draw on magic as you use it is unclear, but end result is you can only use magic by parasitizing magic from others, usually by killing them. It's super illegal, even the DFZ, which is kind of like a cyberpunk magic city where anything's legal. So the fact that this guy Victor was running around doing it was a big deal. Anyway, he used Lola and used humanity's subconscious ability to direct magic at their thoughts to turn her into a monster called Fenrir. He was also working with a fairy king called Albrich, who wanted to break free of the seal the fairy queen had put him in because he was being an asshole and riding around the midnight hunt killing people. Long story short, Victor was trying to ascend to pseudo-godhood by becoming the hero that no one could stop. He put the image of Fenrir in a mind using a movie that he essentially mass-marketed. And Fenrir was unstoppable to dragon magic or fairies or normal mages, but he specifically didn't include any blood magic there. So when the blood magic hero shows up, the entire world is looking at him like a hero who can beat an unbeatable monster. Essentially, he wanted to ascend to godhood, like I said. The first book ended with Lola foiling his plans, getting her human sister, the human she was replaced from, back, and retreating with the fairy queen, her knight, back into a barrow to hide. Uh, Lola lost a lot of her power after she left. She basically just said, I'm not going to fight you, and walked away, which foiled Victor's plans. However, the DFC was still destroyed. Victor is lever now leveraging power, and everything's gone to sit. So three weeks ago, Lola put her soul on the line to save everybody and got away from Victor before he made himself a god. But while she managed to derail the worst of Victor's plans, the rest of the world still sees him as essentially the greatest hero of all time. He's using illusions, gathering up armies, and while the Nightmare King, Albrich, is riding around with their wild hunt, spreading fear of fairies, Victor is now telling everybody that blood magic can kill fairies. And the force of that belief, because they saw him fight what he now has revealed to the world as a fairy, the fairies were in hiding because... I'll talk about them later, but it's cool. Albridge is playing the villain, so Victor needs to play the hero. And Lola doesn't want either of them to win, because if Albridge wins, fairies will now hunt humans for their fear, and they'll be so powerful that humans will have to believe they exist and have to believe their magic works, which means they won't be able to destabilize them by looking at them, which is part of the consequences of being a fairy. However, if Victor wins, he ascends to pseudo-godhood and will try and make blood magic the dominant form of human magic. Which again, considering it literally parasitizes people, often non-mages who can't fight back, it really sucks. Simon and the Black Rider are still trapped under Victor's plan. Simon was a blood mage apprentice who got trapped there. He's interesting. He basically got used blood magic as a kid. Victor grabbed him up and forced him to become his apprentice under fear of being put back in a coma. Meanwhile, you have the Black Rider, whose true name is Valente. He was captured by a fairy who's held him in his glamours and uh, allure. And eventually, Victor fused him with the fairy's Glossomer and replaced the fairy's head with, Vic with Valente's head to the point where he's essentially Victor's slave. Basically, they're still trapped, and Lola just wants to get free and prevent Victor from becoming a god. So... It's, I kind of like this. Basically, you have a villain who tricked the world into thinking he's now the greatest hero of all time. And because of the rules of their world and the stuff Victor's been playing around with with blood magic, he's essentially tied his magic to a lot of people's souls. 
to form himself a pseudo spirit vessel. I'm going to go into a little bit of the magic later because there is some necessary stuff here. But essentially, he's trying to cheat and turn himself into a pseudo god. And that's really cool because we haven't seen a human try and do that yet. We had seen spirits pumping themselves up in the DFZ series which was after the Heart Strikers. And we had already seen how the power of belief affected gods and spirits in the past. But being able to see a human trying to hijack that system and turn themselves into like a living god is a really cool idea for a villain. And one of the things I think makes Victor a really intriguing villain is that he's such an asshole, but he's a charismatic, manipulative, lying sociopath who is just so good at playing people that you actually believe he could play the whole world. The heroes are constantly getting tricked and pawned by him. And he underestimates them, sure, so they eke out minor wins. But Victor has so many contingencies. And it's clear that he's been working on this plan for so long. Like, it's revealed that he was working on this before he even got a hold of Lola. He made a deal with Albrich and then hijacked one of his changelings. Meaning he's been planning this for, like, 19 years or something like that. An insane amount of time. Literally decades of his life have gone into this scheme. And I can, you can only imagine how much influence and power and money he had to do to do this. It's very interesting because the heroes in the first few books learned how magic worked, you know? And sure, we had one god in the DFZ series trying to pump himself up and take over the DFZ, make it about the arena, you know? But, like, even that was a very, very, very dramatic plan. But the thing with Victor is he's sneaky. He's clever. And, yeah, blood magic is dangerous, sure, but Victor shouldn't have this much raw power. The only reason he has this much raw power is because people believe he does. And that's, like, the main thing Lola realizes in this book. I actually like Lola as a protagonist because she feels very vulnerable until she realizes she's only as vulnerable as Victor made her feel. Essentially because her magic, her very body, is affected by the way people perceive her. If they don't believe she's real, she'll literally start to, dis you know, goop turn to goop and ooze away. She has to come to terms with the fact that listening to Victor is a terrible, horrible idea. But the thing is, Victor is so convincing. He, he, he makes it seem like it's all your idea. Like, you're this unstable. You need me to live. You need my pills. You need my blood magic. You don't. He's a con man. A really, really dangerous con man. And Lola finally has that realization, especially once you get revealed something that's a very major spoiler about her that I'm not going to reveal. It's a really cool twist about her and her sister that I kind of pieced together as the book was going on. So that was kind of nice. But essentially, she has to come to a realization that she is powerful. She does have the mind of Fenrir still behind her. So she is able to act. And if she doesn't act, nobody will. Uh, and she really doesn't want Victor to win. That's like the main thing. There are two things Lola cares about. Well, three. Her sister, making sure the people she grew up with and, you know, that are also in Victor's thumb, like Valente and si Simon are still around, that they get to survive, they get to live and have a life, and that Victor loses. And by the end of the book, she is fully committed to fucking Victor over hard. And I am just all for this new confident Lola we're going to have in book three. This was really her transition from the uncertain changeling of book one to this confident leader of this ragtag group that Victor screwed over and they're going to screw him back. She has, like, the Fairy Queen and her, his, you know, her knight working with her. She has Valente at their side. She has Simon at their side by the end of the book. They're free. And now that she's accomplished her first two goals, it's time for goal three. It's time to bring Victor down. I also really like Valente. I think he's a very interesting character. He's one of those characters in books that's sworn to, like, an oath of loyalty, so he can't disobey, but he fi keeps finding workarounds. Like, there's this one point where Lola sends out, like, a scout made of her magic, and Valente is basically argues to himself that, I know my master said to kill her the second I see her, but this won't kill her. This isn't all of her, so clearly I can't kill her right now. I still can't find the rest of her. So you know what? I'm not going to do anything, because I can't accomplish my goal. And it's like that kind of, like, all of his fight for the most part, is inside his own head, constantly trying to logic his way around Victor's orders, which is a very horrible position to be in, but he's very good at it at this point, which I'm very impressed by. Finally, you have Simon, who got betrayed by one of Victor's other servants at the end of the last book, and essentially got trapped in like a blood magic coma, tortured and mentally until he submitted. Uh, Lola manages to free him midway through the book, and he goes undercover on Victor, trying to sabotage his operations. I'm not going to spoil what happens there. Uh, let's just say Simon had a rough time in this book, but hopefully, you know, he'll be able to finally get that revenge and finally do something to stop Victor. Can't wait to see how that plays out. Finally, we also have Albrich as a secondary villain. 
He is basically this old fairy king who used to exist back when fairies were wild and free. Now I'm going to explain this real quick because I do want to explain some of the magic system because I find the fairy magic in this to be so cool. I explained this in my review of the first book by Silver Thread. It would be an eye icon if it wasn't earlier. Basically, fairy magic is based upon belief like a lot of other magic in the series. But it's not based on whether you believe in the magic. It's whether you think the magic could exist. So back in the day, back in like medieval times when magic was running free before the drought, fairies were really powerful because, let's be honest, the average medieval peasant doesn't know how physics work. And so back then, when nobody really understood the natural science of the world, fairies could just conjure giant illusionary forests and walk around with 50 arms and people would be like, I guess that works. And the only people they really had to worry about were mages, priests, and a handful of scholars. And as long as they stayed away from those people, they were essentially all-powerful. They were like the fae of old myths that could like weave time and forests and all sorts of things, drive you mad, grant your greatest desires, all that stuff. However, unlike all the other magical creatures, because when magic came back, it slowly came back for a few years in the first book, The Heart Strikers, and then recently, as early as like, of what I think like eight or ten years ago in the book's timeline, magic came crashing back when the seal finally broke fully and the gods returned. And now magic's like strong as ever, and now there are like billions of humans. So the power of belief that's pumping up gods has pumped them up to like incredible levels. Gods these days are like ten times, twenty times more powerful than they used to be in the past because there are just so many more humans. However, we now have like near universal education and people are required to go to school and learn how physics work and learn how the world works. And so fairies have gotten to the point where they have to hunt in the shadows now. Whereas the return of magic was like this golden age for everyone else. To the fairies, it's like, well, shit. <laughs> now people not only are looking for magic, because magic's everywhere and they're going to notice us. When they look at us, they're going to be like, hey, that person looks like a badly rendered CGI character. There's something off about them. And then we're going to literally start to censor. And the really powerful fairies can be really convincing stuff using their gossamer. But if you're less powerful, like, say, a changeling, like Lola, it means you're very underpowered. And it creates this very convincing thing of, yeah, I can buy that fairies really, 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 really did not want to be seen by the rest of the world. They want to stay in hiding, unlike everyone else. Because they kind of needed to. And it's just a really cool idea that it's still like following the magic equals belief thing that a lot of the other magic in the world works on. But it's working on a completely different axis. And it's revealed that's because the fairies are coming from a different reality. Now I touched on a lot of that during the DFZ series view for Bias Silver Thread. But I really wanted to talk about that because it's just so interesting. In addition, Albrecht is using the Wild Hunt, which for you guys don't know is like a collection of ghosts from old folklore. He's feeding on fear, whereas a lot of other people feel it on dreams. They feel like emotional energy almost. In conclusion, I think this is an excellent sequel to Rachel Aaron's previous book, By a Silver Thread. This is now the 10th book in her DFZ series, and she's still going strong, which is just amazing. She's had three different protagonists as a protagonist. And I am just amazed and want to see more of this world. I love the DFZ as a concept. This cyberpunk city full of gods and dragons and monsters and fairies. It's an excellent setting with some cool ramifications. The city itself is like alive and moving. And each series seems to focus on a new aspect of the world. We had the dragons and the old Merlins in the first one. We had the spirits, the gods, and their stuff with basic human mages in the second with shamans. And now we're getting blood magic and its dark implications with fae and fairies. I cannot wait to see what she does next. So let's hold out hope for the next book. This gets an easy 9 out of 10 for me. Thank you, Rachel Aaron. Seriously, you're so much fun. So, uh, yeah. Moving on from there, we have the announcement. Sorry, this video is probably going to be coming out a little late. I've been a bit delayed and distracted. Uh, just been a little low energy. I'm trying to keep myself going, but we'll see. I am working on my Baldur's Gate 3 review. I should have that out sometime this week, hopefully. Just need to finish editing some of the footage. And then, you know, putting in the actual video to edit. And hopefully this gets out soon. So, yeah, I will see you guys then. I also stream at 7.30 on Tuesday and Thursday on both Twitch and YouTube. Check me out there. It means a lot. we got some people playing Lies of P, so join me over there. Moving on to the out card. We have a subscribe orb. Go to my channel to subscribe. Video to YouTube recommends. Playlist for all the stuff I've done this year. Check them both out. And I will see you all next time. Bye.